so the problem with series games. So I, I at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, I um, getting my master's with a focus in series games. And there, anybody play series games? Not too many. Okay, cool. Good. All right, great. All right, one of those. The, uh, so there's a really big problem with series games. Well, there's a lot of problems with series games. Probably most notably they suck, but that's okay. Um, but the one I want to talk about is that serious games right now are something you play independently. It's like, like reading a book. You pick it up, you play it, you get the message, and then you stop playing it. Um, it's like this read and reflect thing that somehow by playing this, I become a better person. Actually, let me start. For those who don't know what serious games are, they're trying to convey something beyond entertainment. So uh, you can have serious games that are advertising the messages that, oh, buy this product. Or you can have serious games for health, like we saw in that other thing. And they're pushing that agenda, and there's a message, a hidden message, a call to action that they want you to do. And so a lot of them, like I said, are just single player games. And that's, that. it's understandable why they're like that. Um, there's kind of a problem with serious games that game designers don't make serious games. So <laughs> they're just like professors making games because they think that's a good way to reach kids or stuff like that. Um, but this idea is a reflection of Renaissance humanism, and that's a whole, I don't know if anybody cares about psychology, but yeah, <laughs> humanism, in its simpler, simplest form in the educational sense, Renaissance humanism is all about the individual. And the individual, it's up to you to better yourself. And in education, that's where we get the idea of the ivory tower. If you lock yourself in an ivory tower and you read books and just contemplate it, you will become a better person and therefore smarter. Um, that's Unfortunately, there's a lot of research gone into that that just disproves that entirely. Um, so one very prominent educational psychologist, Elon Gertsev, says, humanistic ori oriented education is possible solely at the cost of the transformation into the negative. It's a power that is detrimental to diminish human potential and self-exaltation. So this loner style gameplay is, is bad. And it's just plaguing the industry. Um, let's do some examples. Like, when you play a game, um, I don't know if you guys have played this one, McDonald's video game, right. So the idea of learning is, and the idea of learning we have now is, is discourse, and an opening up discourse allows for you have thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, and then synthesis. So through discourse, you come to a right conclusion. So the problem with this game, you've played, okay, good, people have played it, that's great. So there is a pretty obvious message. Um, Right. For those who haven't played it, you are McDonald's and you do all of these horrible, horrible crimes to boost your profits, right? Like unethical things like giving your cows steroids and feeding or advertising to children just so you make more money. And the idea is if you don't do these things, you will fail. And so it's trying to show you how bad McDonald's is. And I got that conclusion by playing it, and I'm sure you would too, but... Since it's a solo experience, it's actually open entirely to your interpretation. Um, you could play this game, I mean, if you were really dumb, but like, this is just an extreme example. It could play this and see everything in the game and be like, wow, McDonald's, this conclusion you draw is McDonald's has so many negative pressures on them and they choose not to do it. Man, they're such a great corporation. Like, they could so easily inject their cows with hormones and that would make them twice as profitable because that's what the game says. But, you know, that's obviously not what the game's trying to say, but if you don't open up the channels of discourse, then if you draw the wrong conclusion, you're just, you know, you're screwed. And the game itself didn't reach its objective. So another example of this is, is the museum. So there's a, going to a museum, say you're an art student, you go to a museum, and you walk around by yourself and look at all the paintings. You can be like, well, okay, cool, I get it, I get it. And then draw your own conclusions about each of the paintings, and that's solely up to your interpretation. Or you could go with your entire art class. And if you go with your entire art class, everyone is going to have an opinion on the art pieces displayed. And through all of those 20 people's opinions, you will actually reach a decent synthesis of what you actually think the painting's about. So I actually did this. The reason I said, came up with this example is I went to that, that Washington Preservation Museum thing. That uh, art, of, art of Video Games, have you been in Washington, D.C.? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, so they have an exhibit. I went to that, and I went with my class. And it was just mind-boggling the things if we listen to everybody that they come up with. And you're just like, I never thought of that. Um, one of the students noticed that you know, none of the video games show violence, no human-on-human -human violence in that exhibit, which I thought was extremely interesting. And I never would have noticed that. Um, but since we did it as a group, we get all the benefits of collaboration. And like I said, collaboration is a proven 
benefit. That's why we have like group work in school. That's why we do work studies and all these fun things that um, make us interact with each other. So obviously discourse, uh, collective knowledge is the idea that you are only as smart as the information you can get. So us in a room are collectively smart, but I independently am not as smart because we all know different things. Um, collaboration also opens up the zone of proximal development, which is a Vygotsky concept saying that I'm on, I'm, I have a, at a certain level of intelligence, and then above that intelligence is a zone of proximal development, and I can only reach that zone through um, help from an outside source. So like my teacher, I can be X smart, but with the help of my teacher, I can be X plus Y smart. Um, we also allow for the formation of learning groups, which I talked about before. Um, if you learn as a group, you'll feel more comfortable, that sort of thing. So we're going to examine two games that actually do things right. So I will be insulted if you guys haven't played this game. All right, so <laughs> this is like the very old version of Oregon Trail. And the reason Oregon Trail is, hmm? Oregon? Oregon? Oh, God, I'm not from here, so. <laughs> or Y G. Oregon Trail, all right, thank you. All right, so us from the East Coast. It's just illiteracy. Yeah, 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 okay. Fourth generation Oregon. Yeah, okay, so Oregon Trail uh, is, is, is stands it's, it's apart from the others because Oregon Trail is actually played usually in a classroom. And when you play Oregon Trail in a classroom, that's how I played it when I was first played it, um, there's 20, 30 of you um, and when you're done, you all come back and discuss it. And when you do, you get to learn all these different things about the game. Like, if I were to play it once, I would never learn as much as I did if I talked to the 30 other people that played it. So you get to learn all the different aspects of the game. You get to take individual pride in the journey, like whether you died or whatnot. Uh, you get to form this cool learning group. And then, of course, Discord is opened up, which with Oregon Trails, um, how it's played, the teacher usually facilitates that, which is very good. Um, there's, so that's good. So we actually, instead of just playing this game and thinking about it, we get to openly talk about it. But what happens when we're not in the classroom space? Well, uh, I don't know. What do we do? So, well, one game, which is a serious game of much notoriety, is uh, Super Call by Massacre. I don't know if you guys have played it, but it's exactly how it sounds. You take on the role of the, the murderers in the, uh, the Columbine Massacre. And what this game does especially well is that it uses a forum. And according to um, Danny Ladon, like, is, he's the designer of the game, the, um, the forum is equally important to the project as the game itself. Um, the idea is that you would play the game and you experience the horror of it, and then you come and you talk about it. And so without this forum, the game would essentially be useless. Because you go in and then you just mur literally murder people in this game. And there's all sorts of press about how horrible that was. But the idea is, if you go on the forum, you can actually become better for it. You can share your feelings about it, understand it, and reach conclusions about the game itself. Like, it wasn't designed to shock. It's designed to reflect upon why these things happened um, and how we can feel better about it and that sort of thing. And that's only possible through uh, this forum sharing. Um, so then this comes back to the thing I was actually just talking about, um, the magic circle. The problem with the two games before this is that those two mechanisms for discourse are outside of the game space. So all of the positive elements of collaboration take you out of the space. So you immediately remember it's a game because you exited it, came back to real life, and then said, oh, OK, well, it's just a game. And when you say, oh, it's just a game, all the lessons you learn in that game, they don't matter. It also has the problem of it's just like the museum. If we're going to discuss the museum, it's better to be in the museum than to be out of it. Uh, therefore, you, you know, you can look at all of the paintings and that sort of stuff. So all these games suffer from the exact same thing. So how do we, how do we fix that? So the best way is to incorporate all the collaborative elements into the game itself. So f instead of having a form that you leave the game to and go write, maybe there is um, some sort of interactive discussion board in the game or it's multiplayer or anything like that. Um, but the key is to maintain the magic circle while incorporating collaborative elements. Um, otherwise, everything we do is just for naught. So again, this is um, a very long, very long paper. Um, that's awesome. Trust me, I wrote it. And but yeah, if you want to talk to me after, that's cool. Um, and then yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It might be playing devil's advocate. 
I loved it. That's no um, good. Combining both of your talks and understanding that what is viewed as one of the best ways to learn a new language is to put yourself into a community of people that speak that language. In theory, do you feel it would be better to place someone in that situation surrounding them with people speaking a new language and keeping them open to the group scenario or to separate them into a game aspect and incorporate learning in that way? Okay, so, so what was the first one? So <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Affective filter is just through no, the roof right okay. now. Right, so there, this, like, there's just no substitute for learning a language beside like immersion. Like that's the best way to learn a language. So if that's a possibility, I totally advocate for that. So the one of the best things about using video games is that tandem learning aspect. Um, but if you can incorporate a community into um, a language learning scenario, so the idea is like the ideal game would place the entire ELL classroom in in a in a game world where they can share with um, an opposite language learning thing, if that makes sense. So if it was everyone's trying to learn English and they all speak Spanish, you would pair up with another world, all of them speak Spanish and learn English, so you can get that immersion via uh, virtual space, otherwise it's kind of impossible. So the benefits of technology are immeasurable. Like, I can't physically drive you know, or fly to Mexico because like, I don't have the money, I'm in high school, I just got to this country, all that sort of stuff. But like. You can through the technology, and then through that, you can get actual immersion when you not otherwise be capable of it. Sorry, I ran there. Thank you for asking. I can wrap up. Good. Last questions. Good. Okay, great. Thanks so much.